Well, hello and good day. And welcome one and all on this brilliant, gorgeous Saturday afternoon to the celebration of life event in honor of our father, Walter Roberts. Thank you everybody for joining my brothers, sisters-in-law, wife, Patricia, in this place which meant so much to dad. And who is it who's here? We're not gonna go around the room and introduce everybody. That would take just a little bit too long. But it's friends, colleagues, protégés, and you'll hear some more about them and about the entire concept of friendship and collegiality and mentorship. It's friends from the Navy who knew him. It's friends and neighbors from Watergate South. And it's family and friends from elsewhere. Allowed me to lead off, if I could, with two very special thank yous. First, to the Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication, and to the Walter Roberts Endowment, led respectively by Shauna Day and Mickey East. And now at this juncture, most especially to Lola Pack. Lola, you're at the back of the room. You can raise your hand, and those who are able, please turn around. Lola, who was lent to to us, lent to Patricia, by Shauna Day, has done an absolutely magnificent job coordinating and organizing. We can't thank you enough. I'm not gonna do it right now, but you are admonished, you're not allowed to leave till you get a small gift <laughs> from the Roberts brothers and their, and their wives. So thank you, Lola. How about a round of applause for Lola? And of course, a big thank you to my gorgeous wife, Patricia, who, as you all know, has served as Charlie's, Larry's, and my principal voice on all matters related to the celebratory event. Coordinating with Lola, compiling the guest list, and as you can well imagine, that guest list has morphed a few times, and modifying it many times along the way, communicating with numerous actual and potential attendees across the United States and indeed across the globe, including the United Kingdom and Australia. Wow. You've been amazing as you always are, and thank you from all of us here today. We're gonna to try and keep the formal section, as it were, of this program to under an hour. Um, I guess I'll be the monitor and I'll do the best I can. You have your programs in front of you and you'll see the proposed sequence of events, but if we need to deviate slightly, we'll just go ahead and do so. So a special initial introductor, introduction excuse me, to Pastor Gloria Island. I see you there, Gloria, in the back row, but you're strategically placed on the aisle. I would like to term her the lead angel, if I could, Pastor Island, the lead angel of a group of angels, numbering four, I believe all here today, or at least three of the, all four are here, Georgia, Shelley, and Crystal. And as those of us in the medical profession and those of us who become increasingly chronologically impaired wish for us and wish for our loved ones, it's not only a long life, but it's also a good quality of life. And Gloria and her band of angels assisted first my mother, and then my father lead that high quality of life until, in my dad's case, the end of June of this year. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, ladies, for all you've done for our family. You are family. And if I could ask you to come forward with a reflection. Good evening. Amen. To Bill, Pat, Larry, Siobhan, Charlie, Dale, Jody, all the grandchildren, and to all of you, his friends. As you know, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> As most of you know, Walter Roberts was my employer, but he was more than my employer. He was my confidant my counselor, and my friend. I miss him terribly. There is not a day that goes by that I don't think of him. I think of his wisdom. I think of his jokes. <laughs> 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 
he could tell some funny jokes. <laughs> he would have me rolling in the aisle. Yet he was a no-nonsense man. So I wrote this little tribute as a remembrance of our friendship and love for each other. God made some wonderful things. He made birds, he made bees, he made butterflies, flowers in the spring, made showers, and then he made Walter Roberts. <laughs> it has been said that real friends are very hard to find. The ones that stay when times are tough. Real friends, the lasting kind. And as I traveled through this life, I have found this to be true. I will never, never find a friend that I found in Walter Roberts. Amen. Thank you so much, Gloria. And now to speak briefly about the endowment and anything else they might choose to speak about, first Mickey East and then Shauna Day. Or in whichever order you choose. Good afternoon. <clears throat> On behalf of the Walter Roberts Endowment, it's my honor to uh, welcome you to this place. Uh, and uh, you will hear more about the endowment from various other folks who will be talking about it uh, uh, in the next uh, few minutes. Walter was one of the dearest and most pleasant people I have ever had the privilege of knowing. Unlike many of you, my connection with Walter was not via his remarkable career in international information and broadcasting. In fact, he was retired when we met. And I had an inkling that perhaps his dear wife, Gisa, was wanting to, him to find something to do outside the house. <laughs> thus, thus it was that I met Walter. It was over lunch at the Metropolitan Club. George Washington University President Lloyd Elliott invited me, his newest and youngest dean of the School of International Affairs, to lunch in order to meet a friend. I think it's fair to say that Walter and I hit it off well. I was certainly impressed by the way he talked about the changes taking place in information technology and its growing impact on foreign affairs. And he sketched out how public diplomacy a concept I was just vaguely familiar with at that time would be an ever more valuable and key element in foreign policy and how right he was. But I must admit what focused my mind most after our lunch was President Elliott's parting comment to this new dean that he really thought it would be great to have Walter affiliated with the school and for me to look into it. Well, under ordinary circumstances, this would have been a very welcome news. The president of the university himself was paying attention to our school, and he was helping us to bring this top quality resource. But in fact, I did not consider this request that welcome at the time. As a new dean, I was in the midst of trying to get a tighter handle on the school and its priorities and programs and to rein in the curriculum. It seemed like every faculty member, member needed at least one new course for their own program, and they saw every one of these needs, of course, as critical. Yet here I was, myself, now proposing a new course that really did not fit any of our existing programs and was being taught by a person none of them had never met. But Walter was precisely the type of adjunct faculty the school needed. And his proposal for a course was precisely the type of cutting edge move we needed to take. After running my proposal for hiring Walter by several senior faculty colleagues, things went ahead quickly and smoothly. Walter and I have always claimed that to the best of our knowledge, he taught the first course specifically focused on public diplomacy in the United States, if not the, not the world. And nobody's disputed us. On a more personal note, 
Walter and Gisela became dear friends. He was a valued colleague who shared his wisdom and professional contacts. When he moved to the Watergate, there were even more opportunities to chat over lunch or an afternoon cuppa. We often discussed foreign affairs, and as many of you know, Walter was always working on his own research and publication projects, and we would discuss that. I greatly valued talking with Walter upon the death of my father, and later on my decision to retire from the university. Walter was always suggesting ideas for events and people to invite to the school. Back in the 1980s, each school had its own full-blown graduation ceremony. With our own speaker, we granted our own honorary degrees and the like. Walter was primarily responsible for getting Brent Scowcroft and Lawrence Eagleburger, two of his old Belgrade colleagues, as our commencement speakers in successive years. I can tell you my fellow deans were envious of the quality of Elliott School speakers and, of course, the media attention they attracted. More recently, after I retired and returned to the area, my visits every few weeks with Walter were bright moments I truly treasured. Serving on the Walter Board's endowment board provided one reason for me to visit with him, but it was certainly not necessary. Far more important for both of us, I think, was the cross-generational friendship and camaraderie that had developed over the years. It will never be replaced. I miss him terribly. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, I guess. Uh, my name is Sean Ade, and I'm the director of the Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication, which was originally uh, called the Public Diplomacy Institute when it was founded uh, by Walter Roberts uh, with a generous endowment. I'm here to talk just for a couple of moments about the endowment as an extension of not only Walter, but, but his legacy. And before I do that, I do want to mention that uh, the director of the School of Media and Public Affairs, where I am permanently housed. Uh, the in, the uh, institute, by the way, is part School of Media and Public Affairs and part Elliott School. But the, um, the director of the School of, Public, of uh, Media and Public Affairs, Frank Sesno, is traveling to California, but he sends his wishes and best regards and uh, was a huge fan of Walter's, and I think the feeling was mutual. Uh, Frank, of course, a longtime CNN correspondent, uh, Emmy Award winner, uh, got his start actually at Voice of America. And so he uh, had a soft spot in his heart for VOA and therefore for Walter, and they had a lot uh, to talk about together. Um, one of the things about professors and public diplomats is that we both measure our progress and our impact uh, in the long term. And I think that that can definitely be said about Walter in so many ways, but um, in my narrow connection to him through the Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication. He's done this in so many ways uh, that will live beyond him, more than I can mention in a short period of time. But just as an idea, uh, when I first took over the Institute in 2008, uh, the very first meeting that I was director, um, Walter pounded the table and said, I want to see more activity from this Institute. I want us to be doing things. I want us out there uh, being in the community. And at, from that moment on, the Institute has really been able, because of the generosity of Walter and also because of his vision, to become a real key player in the intellectual life of George Washington University and I think Washington uh, writ large. Uh, we do a number of events every year. Um, and one event that I want to focus on is something we started four years ago, and that's the Roberts Lecture. Um, this is something that the, with the Walter Roberts Endowment Board we decided to do in honor of Walter, uh, and it's had an amazing array of speakers. Just uh, recently we had former Ambassador Robert Ford give an amazing talk about what he's learned about public diplomacy, about Syria, about Iraq, and it was just really epitomized exactly what Walter wanted uh, from those lectures. I know in my talks with him, he often mentioned Ambassador Ford as someone he wanted to speak at that event, and I know he would have been very proud uh, and interested uh, in what he heard. 
Um, perhaps most importantly, uh, the Institute and its affiliated program, that's uh, the Global Communication Master's Program, uh, has been able to train the next generation of public diplomats. And I know that's something that really was important to Walter um, and important to us. Um, we have a small program of 20 to 25 students a year, but somewhere between five and seven of them every, in every class choose public diplomacy as their area of concentration. They come here because of what GW means in the area of public diplomacy, and that began with the foundation of the Public Diplomacy Institute uh, with Walter. Um, four years ago, we also started something uh, through that program, uh, the Roberts Award for the Study of Public Diplomacy as a way, again, of honoring him, but also of building out uh, that legacy. Um, and we've had uh, some amazing people win that award. We've had some amazing people not win that award, actually. Uh, it's extremely competitive. Um, and it gives $1,500 to the winner upon graduation. And they get to use that as they're starting their careers, in, uh, in some cases in the Foreign Service, in other cases in other areas of public diplomacy. Uh, I would also say I was reminded of this when I saw uh, Mark Taplin here, who is uh, a public diplomacy fellow with us uh, when I started at the Institute, that um, we have fellows that teach public diplomacy classes at the undergraduate and graduate level. And uh, all of them have told me that Walter was uh, probably the most popular guest speaker that they had in their classes. Um, that the students really were energized by hearing his stories and seeing his passion uh, for the topic. Uh, on a personal note, um, for the years that I've been at the Institute, uh, I've been fortunate enough, like many of you I know in this room, to have regular lunches with Walter. Not as regular as some, uh, but every couple of months or so, I would go over to his apartment and we would have lunch for usually about two and a half hours. We, we both had flexible schedules. And um, uh, <laughs> another great thing about diplomats and professors' lives. Um, but. Um, uh, they were just amazing, and um, you know, one of the interesting things that we, we touched on right away was that Walter and I lived in the same apartment building. Um, when I first moved to Washington uh, with my now wife, we lived in the Saxony over on Clydesdale Place in Adams Morgan, and it turns out Walter and his wife lived in the Saxony about 40 years before I did, but, um, uh, but more, than more than that, yes. <laughs> You're right, actually. Um, yeah, anyway, I was trying not to take myself. But, um, uh, but they were, they were amazing uh, lunches and, you know, by dint of his experience and his expertise, he could have been a pontificator, you know, somebody who lectures uh, for two and a half hours, which, by the way, would have been fine with me uh, as someone who loves history uh, and loves what he had to talk about. But like the great public diplomat that Walter was, uh, he was a great conversationalist and a great listener. And it always amazed me how open he was to hearing what someone else had to say, um, whether that was uh, you know, Bruce Gregory and he having these amazing discussions about the future of public diplomacy, uh, or just sitting down with someone like me and, and being able to listen to my incredibly ignorant questions and, and treating them like, uh, like they were worth something. And he was always open. And it's why he was such a, a great thinker about public diplomacy, and that really uh, inspires us in how we run not only our institute but our program and how we teach public diplomacy at GW. Um, he was also, uh, finally, a great raconteur, as all you all know. Um, someone's mentioned his amazing sense of humor. Um, when the, uh, the Kennan biography came out, I made a point of calling him uh, straight away to go see him, and uh, that was maybe the best lunch I ever had with him. And uh, he told amazing stories about, about Kennan and uh, particularly about his, um, his emphasis on uh, making sure that the, the world knew the story George Kennan wanted to tell about himself. And he told interesting stories about Kennan coming into Walter's hotel room late at night in his pajamas with his notes that he had written up for his diary that day, asking Walter if that's how he remembered it too, and Walter saying, no, not at all, and Kennan saying, well, I think this is better. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and finally, of course, he loved to talk about soccer. And I confess, I'm not an expert on soccer. I watch the World Cup, and I watch my kids. But he would always tell me about the great uh, game that was on uh, that week on ESPN 75 or something uh, to watch some European League game. And by the way, I know that some of his grandkids and, 
and other uh, relatives, younger relatives are here. He would also always tell me how you guys were doing uh, in your soccer uh, careers. Um, and so today, uh, this morning, I drove two hours round trip to watch my eight-year-old daughter play soccer. And I thought that was a perfect way to, uh, to start this day. And I, I wish he was here that I could tell him that she scored three goals and had a great game. Uh, but, uh, and just to talk to him generally, I miss him very much. He was a great figure here at GW and he'll be very much missed. Thank you, gentlemen, and uh, I know that my parents' residency at the Saxony was well over 40 years ago because I was a year old when they left, well more than 40 years ago, <laughs> I promise. We're now going to ask uh, four special friends um, to deliver some tributes, uh, starting with Jim Connolly and followed by Barry Fulton, Bruce Gregory, and Jacques Shirley. Good afternoon. I've come all the way from Notre Dame, Indiana, avoiding the snow. <laughs> Good call. Yeah. When news of the death of Walter Roberts struck, people stopped in the street and cried aloud in their hearts. For he was their leader, their hero, and their artist in government. I served under Walter in Zagreb from 1960 to 1962 and in Belgrade from 1962 to 1964. In 1963, Walter, Giza, and the boys were preparing to return to the United States on home leave. And I put a question to him. Our daughter Kate, then about five years old, to a year younger than the twins, was sorely missed by her grandparents, being the first granddaughter. And so I said to Walter, would you and Giza be willing to shepherd her uh, to New York, where she'd be picked up by her grandparents? And he smiled and he said, of course. And so it was done. Kate remembers playing checkers with Larry and Charlie on the plane. And Walter and Giza, she felt safe with them. There was a closeness that developed between Walter and my daughter that was touching to observe. <laughs> we know how astute Walter was. The tender side of his personality was not so obvious. He was a gentleman of the old school, and I miss him very much. The, the setting is the Soccer Hotel in Vienna. A distinguished diplomat, a storied broadcaster, and a beloved professor walk into the bar. The bartender looks up and with a broad smile says, good evening, Dr. Roberts, You're drinking alone? <laughs> uh, I, I, <laughs> uh, I, I thought of repeating one of his favorite jokes in which a young man is advised to entertain his fiancée at the soccer hotel. I tried it out on a mutual friend who said, if you can't tell it as well as Walter, don't even try. <laughs> I, I won't. A instead, uh, I'll recall some of what I learned in uh, what I call my Wednesdays with Walter. Every other week for the past several years, Walter would receive me in his apartment before dinner with coffee and cookies prepared by Gloria. Gloria, thank you. We discussed politics and swap jokes. 
for the most part, I was his student, trying to absorb the lessons from an extraordinary life. I learned of his boarding a train at the Westbahnhof station in Vienna to escape from the Nazi threat in 1938. Uh, how did you escape, I asked. Oh, that was not the problem. Leaving was not the issue. Being received elsewhere was the challenge. Cambridge welcomed him, and after completing his doctorate, he received an appointment at Harvard. And what a treasure for the United States when Walter Roberts began a career with the Voice of America that extended to his mastery of diplomacy, research, writing, teaching. Of course, reuniting with and marrying Giza, who had preceded him to the States, would have been his first blessing in his new country. Another story, this one when he was posted to Belgrade. President Johnson had sent Avril Harriman to Yugoslavia to persuade Tito to use his good offices to assist in ending the Vietnam War. Walter was present as a note taker, as I learned from him. Tito rudely dismissed Harriman's request. And after some awkward moments, Tito looked at Harriman and asked him when he was born. November 1891, Harriman said. Tito glared at him, stood up, left the room. Walter turned to Tito's aide and said, what does this mean? Uh, uh, no idea, said the aide. W will he be back? The aide said, I don't know. <laughs> Ten minutes later, Tito returned with several dusty bottles of wine, bottled in 1891. <laughs> we were born at practically the same time, Tito said. Let's celebrate. And as Walter recounted the story, they celebrated into the wee hours. Awakening the next morning in the delegation's hotel in Dubrovnik, Harriman advised Walter to write a cable to President Johnson. Harriman said he had such a hangover he couldn't recall the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so somewhere in the National Archives is a telegram to the President signed by Ambassador Harriman written by the fine hand of Walter Roberts. <laughs> uh, I, I was cautioned not to, intake, not to take the entire two hours of this celebration <laughs> to remember my best friend. And I promised not to shed another tear, not today. I braced myself by recalling a memory of Walter that you will recognize, the twinkle in his eye. His contributions to the war effort at VOA, his distinguished career in public diplomacy, his scholarship, his reputation as a raconteur, his unforgettable decency, all will be remembered, but none more so than his wonderful sense of humor and the twinkle in his eye. One of the things Barry learned from Walter, I guess, is how to tell a good story. <laughs> uh, it's an honor to be asked by the Roberts family to say a few words uh, on this occasion. Uh, others here can speak more knowledgeably than I about Walter's extraordinary career as an American diplomat, his accomplishments at VOA, and overseas. Our paths had crossed at the U.S. Information Agency, but I came to know him best during his second career when he was on the U.S. Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy and his association with George Washington University. For those years I'd like to remember today. Walter was not only a highly skilled practitioner, he was one of those rare diplomats who thought deeply about the meaning of diplomacy, its institutions, and how it is carried out. He could talk with equal facility about the 1927 Havana Convention on the Duties of Diplomats and the implications of taking a Yugoslav journalist to lunch. He was a true pioneer. He understood early on that diplomacy had fundamentally changed when nations 
as a matter of course, began to communicate with people in other countries as well as their governments. His service on the commission, a bipartisan, presidentially appointed oversight panel of prominent Americans, gave him an opportunity to reflect. He was appointed by President George H.W. Bush and confirmed by the Senate in 1991. President Clinton appointed him to a second term in 1994. Walter was the only career diplomat to serve on the commission in its now 66-year history. When his second term was over, the commission asked him to remain as a senior advisor, <coughs> another first. He brought to its deliberations the unique insights of a highly skilled diplomat and a deep knowledge of public diplomacy from the perspectives of both Washington and the field. His political antenna and sense of timing were superb. He had what Isaiah Berlin called practical wisdom, a political intelligence that intuitively grasps how to get things done and what will work and what will not. Walter, as we've heard, also valued teaching and the academic study of diplomacy. As Mickey suggested, he taught a popular course on public diplomacy, but the course title was Diplomacy in the Information Age for 10 years here at the Elliott School. He was a founding member of the Public Diplomacy Council, which for many years has had a close association with GW. And as Sean has indicated, he was a leader with others in establishing what is now the Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication. Walter not only taught courses on public diplomacy, he wrote about how it emerged to become part of mainstream diplomacy. His many speeches and articles on how diplomacy has changed were, I think, among the greatest contributions uh, of his career as a scholar. Speeches at the Kreisky Forum in Vienna, at Chatham House in London, and the Council on Foreign Relations in Washington. His academic journal of choice uh, for years was the Mediterranean Quarterly, published by Duke University. There and in the Foreign Service Journal and in the online AmericanDiplomacy.org, he provided us with an extraordinary body of work. I assign his 2006 article on the evolution of diplomacy to students every semester. It remains one of the most cited articles in the quarterly's long history. These occasional writings, full of rich insights, complement his monumental book on Yugoslavia, Tito Mihailovic and the Allies. Walter remembered and honored the past, but he was always looking ahead. More than many in his generation, he was alive to the possibilities of change and a 21st century diplomacy that would be very different from what he had experienced. I shall remember many things about Walter, his wit, his charm, his intellect, his curiosity, his well-documented extraordinary ability to tell a good story, something I envied greatly, his insights into people and issues and his ability to listen to my crazy ideas without cracking a smile. We talked endlessly about public diplomacy, its history, its practice, and its transformation in today's world. When he left the commission, we continued to meet regularly, often over lunch, at his favorite restaurant, De Carlos, then in recent years in his Watergate apartment. His greeting in our meetings and on the phone was always a cheery, so what goes on? You tell me, I would reply. You know what's going on better than I do, and usually he did. This would lead to an hour or two of animated conversation in which we agreed, sometimes vigorously disagreed, and plotted to resume on the next occasion. He was a remarkable friend, and I shall miss him a great deal. May I move this uh, bill for just a tiny little bit? It's not part of my generation's <laughs> track. Uh, I owe you, no, not all of you, some of you, uh, an apology because <clears throat> in 
very soon after we learned of Walter's death, uh, Chaba Chikesh uh, called me and asked if I would uh, write uh, something about uh, Walter's life, uh, which he then, uh, um, I sent to several friends who were here, so they have read it, and perhaps a few others of you uh, have, you, but uh, for those of you who haven't, you're going to hear bits and pieces of it in the course of the next few minutes. You have heard uh, very old, very dear friends of mine uh, speak eloquently uh, about Walter's career uh, and about their affection for him. Uh, I would like to speak to you, I think, only about Walter the man. Obviously, you know, the public record speaks uh, for, his, for his public life. Uh, and most especially those of us who were privileged uh, to work for him, we really don't need to be reminded of his achievements, but what of Walter as a man? Each of us sees him in a slightly different light. Our impressions necessarily colored by our experience and by the ways his life impinged on ours. <clears throat> Perhaps because I spent so many years uh, in the lands of the old Imperium, I find it hard to talk about Walter without first talking about his origins. Walter was born in Vienna as the dual monarchy of Austria and Hungary was living its last days. Too often, as the distinguished Hungarian historian Istvan Deák observed, Austria-Hungary is viewed as decrepit, moribund, and obsolete. But it also produced, Professor Dag said, dazzling economic development, a railway density matching that of France, an education system that together with the emancipation of a million Jews created much of modern physics, mathematics, nuclear science, computers, medicine, and culture. It was in the fading years of this intellectually inspired epoch that Walter first saw the light of day. Although the collapse of the dual monarchy soon followed, and the brilliance that had characterized it flickered and then mutated into turbulence and savagery. Yet, yet, the influence of his profoundly cultivated parents and their circle, followed by his years first at gymnasium and then at the University of Vienna, marked him as a deeply civilized Central European. A man open to culture and to ideas in all their variety. The world of the Habsburgs, the Freuds, the Schnitzlers, the Klimts, and the Kokoschkas was already teetering and was soon brutally crushed. The agony of Stefan Zweig which he conveys so very vividly in his autobiography, was shared by men like Walter and by his wife Giza and by tens of thousands like them. What choices other than self-destruction exist in a world that you are born into and then is destroyed 
when its place is taken by a vile doctrine that rejects every norm of civilization, that repudiates values, values hitherto respected as universal, that burns the books you were taught to revere, what do you do when your very life becomes forfeit? What choice is there other than exile? How a man handles being uprooted, how he manages the devastating psychic consequences of physical and mental dislocation is a severe test of his mettle. Some fail utterly and spend the rest of their lives bemoaning their loss. Indeed, the longer they lament, the more fanciful their memories of the past become. Some, perhaps a majority, live out their lives suspended between the world they left behind and the reality of the new one in which they had been thrust. Some few, the ones with the firmest principles, those fortified by the, true, the truest moral compasses, they assess their circumstances, determine how they can best contribute to leaving the world a slightly better place, and then they set to work. To this last group, Walter Roberts resolutely and unquestionably belonged. Already in his 20s, when he came to the United States, he immersed them himself in the study of our history, our system of government, and our values. Everything he read and learned enriched his already strong belief that what had been created here was remarkable. But in 1940, as the world grew dark, a place of, this was a place of hope and of light for mankind. From this belief, Walter never wavered. And to this conviction, he dedicated his long life. Walter Roberts had become an American. I first worked for Walter in distant 1960 when he was posted as Counselor of Public Affairs uh, to our embassy in Belgrade. Very quickly, my colleagues and I recognized that he was a man of superior intelligence with a deep understanding of the complexities of the Yugoslavia uh, of the time. But there was more than that. Perhaps because he was dusted with the pollen of a half dozen European cultures and understood profoundly the psychologies of the peoples of the continent, he had a genius for interpreting to the larger American world American policies and purposes. There was something instinctive in this, something that came easily and without artifice. Walter was also one of those rare beings with a talent for divining the thoughts of his interlocutors, uh, usually before they themselves had quite <laughs> sorted out their own ideas or what they were going to say and his incomparable memory really, I think Barry, you mentioned it, fell, fell into the same category. And it, not just when he was jousting with the opposition and he jousted very effectively, but also at a thousand meetings with that twinkle in his eye of which you spoke, uh, Barry, and I believe Jim also, and with courteous certainty he could say, uh, yes, but that isn't quite the way it happened. <laughs> <coughs> These
qualities helped make Walter the fine diplomat that he was. But I think one has to look further to understand the loyalty uh, and the affection that he commanded. In the last decade of his life, a small group of former colleagues gathered around Walter to augment the unfailing loving support of his sons and their families. To name these friends would embarrass them, but I'm looking at quite a few of them as I speak, uh, and they know who they are. If they were asked to say what inspired the closeness of their friendship to Walter, I think they would cite, indeed some of them have already done so this afternoon, his humanity, his kindness, and his wonderful sense of humor. Looking back over 50 years of memories of my own friendship with Walter, one stands out among the many. At the last senior staff meeting before Walter Roberts' retirement, Director James Keogh opened the meeting with an eloquent tribute to Walter's achievements at USIA. Jim Keogh spoke at some length because Walter's story was a long one and because his story was in many ways also the story of USIA. I was sitting next to Walter who had in front of him a yellow legal pad. As the director spoke, Walter made a few notes. Then he grew still and he bowed his head quite low. I heard a sound and turned my head. A tear had fallen from Walter's eye and dropped on the paper. And then one more. In a voice barely audible and in words meant only for himself, Walter said, only in America. Gentlemen, those were lovely. Thank you so very much. If I could now call on Jody, and then Larry, and then Charlie to come up and say a few words. And Larry, I haven't already mentioned, I think that the slideshow you put together is absolutely spectacular. Thanks so much for being here. Jock has always been a terribly difficult act to follow. <laughs> I first uh, met Walter in Vienna, summoned from Stockholm to appear before the Stanton Commission with other PAOs. I couldn't quite figure out this looming uber serious man who was masterminding this affair. So there wasn't any zither music. <laughs> we met again about five years ago at Nancy Foster's book signing. Walter wanted to talk about our mutual friend, the late, lovely Phil Arnold. And then I think I was invited to Watergate for one of the exceptional, now reverend, Gloria Island's thinning lunches. <laughs> <laughs> well, Barry, Bruce, Jim, and Jock have shared with us a Walter that it took a while for me to fully appreciate. But it took no time at all to know that he was warm and charming and fun, a perfect gentleman. One brother, 
referred to me as Walter's lady friend. He had several. <laughs> but me, lady, moi, <laughs> it is still amazing that two such very different individuals could hit it off so well. Probably, I think, because Walter was so comfortable in his own skin. He made it easy to talk and sometimes argue about everything under the sun and the moon. Every day I learned something from Walter. Occasionally, some morsel was new to him, like the expression, elephant in the room. <laughs> he was delighted to add to his incredible memory. Walter loved his radio, the evening TV news, Charlie Rose, <coughs> and yes, soccer, but also the World Series, the Redskins. I'm glad he's not looking at them now. <laughs> his computer and his emails, thanks a lot to Barry. Oysters and lobsters, champagne, and Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. But he loved his friends, all of you, more, and he loved his family most. He adored his wife, a soulmate for over three quarters of a century. He was devoted to the boys, and he loved his daughters-in-law in full measure. He rejoiced at the successes and worried about the problems of each of his grandkids and related all their activities with total interest or with concern where it was merited. The last weeks of Walter's life, every day I saw him, his first question was, what the hell's happening in Ukraine? <laughs> and that wouldn't be any different today. And we often talked about his next article, this to be finally more personal about his father. The last morning, he was sharp as a tack, as you all would suspect. Favorable chance, I have always believed, is the God of all things. How very lucky I was to get to know and to love the most remarkable Walter Roberts, truly a man for all seasons. So I say arrivederci, Watergate boyfriend. <laughs> On behalf of uh, my family, I'm very grateful for all the kind words that have already been said about my father, Walter Roberts. My father was a remarkable man. He was adored by me, my wife, my children, his grandchildren. I actually left California after my Navy career primarily to live closer to my parents because of our close relationship. My mother told me a story uh, that when she learned she was pregnant with twins, that being Charlie and me, uh, my father was traveling overseas at the time as a press officer at the Austrian treaty talks. And so she waited until his return to tell him the news. He then asked, uh, why didn't you just call and tell me while I was in Europe? And my mom replied, I wanted to make sure you'd come home. <laughs> On, on the occasion of Charlie's and my birth, uh, the obstetrician went to the waiting room and told my dad, you now have three boys. He panicked, thinking triplets had been born. <laughs> Siobhan, my wonderful wife, met my father for the first time on the occasion of his 50th anniversary and just after our engagement. We flew from Guam to D.C. for a surprise arrival at La Maison Blanche. My mom hugged me, then hugged Siobhan, then looked at her and said, and who are you? <laughs> and then Siobhan met my dad, immediately taken by his charm, his wit, his love for my mom and for the family, 
and the huge show of support from friends and other relatives who were there. My father always impressed me with his wisdom of contemporary history and his life story, as has been mentioned. The story of his saga starting in Austria and then forced to leave everything behind. It never ceases to amaze me how fragmented his family and life became for him and my mom and so many others. And yet with tenacity and strength, he was able to meet up with my mom and get married in 1939 in New York. Their story is really what fairy tales are made of. And in such a short time, starting in 1942, to have achieved so much with the Voice of America, United States Information Agency, and all the other events were truly remarkable. Whenever I listen to news events unfurling in Israel or Eastern Europe, or frankly anywhere, and I'd ask for his opinion and analysis, he had a perspective and an interpretation of the events that led to clarity and understanding with almost a century of personal experience and wisdom behind it. And by the number of phone calls he got daily from friends also asking for his thoughts and wisdom on current affairs, I clearly was not the only one who appreciated his wisdom. He was a loving father and grandfather my oldest son, Matt, is in flight, Navy flight training in Pensacola currently and couldn't be here, but cherished his time with my father and made a stop in D.C. on his way home from college on a regular basis in order to see his opapa. But the relationship he had with all my children was precious, and he never uh, was short of advice and encouragement to each of them. He had a tremendous sense of humor and repeated old Austrian Altgraf Bobby jokes to the grandchildren who never seemed to get enough. <laughs> we spent many holidays together, and when we planned dinners at De Carlo's, the grandchildren never missed an opportunity to be with him. Two of my children are here today, Kevin and Kate. After government service, my father taught at GW in the Elliott School of International Affairs, and the course that he taught, uh, has been mentioned, was called Foreign Policy in the Information Age. Uh, we criticized him many times because he was such a lenient grader, but that was not the reason so many students tried hard to get into his class year after year. He was an eloquent speaker and knew how to mentor and teach. His prolific writing and public speaking will be missed. He was a precise historian, searching old records and interviewing eyewitnesses to be completely accurate. His memory was truly remarkable. On the occasion of the announcement of the 20, 75th VOA birthday anniversary date, my father recalled a different date when VOA was created, and he was there at the time, and after finding proof to substantiate his recall, he then corrected an inaccuracy. <coughs> Only one year ago, uh, the article How Austria Reappeared on the Map of Europe, a sequel to a previous article about the country's disappearance during Nazi Germany, this was published in a more recent article in American Diplomacy entitled Tito Personal Reflections was only published a few months ago. He worked hard up until the very end. And there were innumerable articles and presentations throughout his career. He leaves behind a sentinel book that at one time was banned in Yugoslavia, and yet he lived to see it republished in Serbian exactly 40 years after it was originally released. He, gra he um, graced the podium when he spoke. He graced the microphone when he broadcasted for VOA. He graced the lecture hall when he taught. And he graced the paper on which was printed so many of his works. For me, he was a great dad. He gave me advice, ranging from parenting, uh, to finances, to travel. He tried to teach diplomacy to me, although I'm not sure that skillfully rubbed off on me. In his later years, uh, when he had a health concern, he would call me for an opinion as a surgeon, then he would call Bill for his opinion as an emergency physician, and then he would finally call Charlie for a legal perspective, <laughs> since Bill's and my advice often differed. <laughs> a consummate diplomat, keeping all the kids involved equally. 
I am very grateful for all my dad's close friends who stayed fully involved and called or stopped by or had meals with him regularly, especially Gloria and Georgia and Crystal and Shelley and of course Bob Jays who were all so attentive and Jody who had a special relationship with him in recent years and all the longtime friends, some of whom are here and some who could not make it. Thank you all for what you did. He stayed engaged and relevant. I hope that together we keep his spirit and legacy alive and well. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm the other twin, Charlie. It's great to see all of you here. Uh, uh, some people that I've met today that I only had a name before and I can now associate with a face, and it's a pleasure seeing all of you here. I knew by the time that I was going to get up here that almost everything would have been said about my dad. And uh, fairly true. I mean, so much has been said that is, is so accurate. And I thought I might, uh, when I saw the program and I saw that I was near the end, I thought I would kind of give a little different perspective and talk a little bit about some of the things about him that you may or may not know about him. Uh, first thing that I want to talk about is he was one heck of a table tennis player. <laughs> he loved the game of ping pong. He taught me and my brothers how to play. And it became one of my passions. And I rarely beat him, even when I was in my college age years. And I think the few times that I did beat him, I think he let me. He was, he was good. One thing I didn't know we had a picture of it, but another passion of his was model electric trains. He loved them immensely. He, over the years, bought us uh, upgrades to our electric train set. And I think to this day, my twin brother Larry has the remains of that train set that he's built upon and his sons have embellished upon and they continue to play with. And I think one of those pictures showed my dad on the floor playing with the trains. Some of you have already talked about his love of sports. He does love soccer, he did love soccer. And his two favorite teams were the Dodgers, baseball, I think having lived in New York, he became a Brooklyn Dodger fan. And then of course he became a a uh, hardened Redskin fan, as I have been for many years. And every Sunday, I would call him up and talk to him about the game. Sometimes during the game, we would talk, always after the game. And I find myself very often on Sundays, right now, getting ready to go to the phone and telling him, did you see what the Redskins just did or did <laughs> not do? My dad's idea of dressing casually was wearing a tie with a colored shirt <laughs> as opposed to a white shirt. And regardless of what his plans were for the day or how he felt during that day, he would shave every day. I think in the last 50 years he did not own a pair of shorts. I saw some of the pictures up there. There's one right there. Um, Thank you. Right, yep. As many of you, you may know, every day he read the Washington Post cover to cover, read the New York Times cover to cover, and every day he would watch the evening news, starting off years ago with CBS, then he went to PBS, but he made sure that he got his fill of the news. And as my brother touched upon, if he detected anything inaccurate or incomplete, he would do the research to make sure that he was satisfied as to what the true picture was of that particular issue. Something that you, many of you may not know about, the, the last few years of my uh, mom's life, my dad started watching The Young and the Restless <laughs> with, with her. And after my mom passed away, he continued to watch The Young and the Restless <laughs> and became a real fan of the show. <laughs> and invariably, perhaps once a week, he would call my wife Val or Patricia 
and talk about some of the plots and some of the absurdity of some of the plots and ask for explanations on what are they thinking. He and, and I must confess that all of us, including him, I think beginning with him, loved the Pink Panther series of movies starring Peter Sellers. And he and my brothers and now my kids would often mimic the accent of Peter Sellers in those silly movies. And something that I don't even think I told my brothers about, but uh, in the spring when my dad had a slight fall and hit his head, the way he reported the incident to me was by telling me on the phone, I received a bump upon the head. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, want, I want to uh, e echo what my twin brother Larry said about my dad. He was a devoted father, uh, devoted father-in-law, uh, devoted grandfather, uh, great-grandfather. My oldest daughter has two children. She was unable to be here today, but my uh, two others, Trevor and Chelsea, are here. My wife, Val, is here. He loved all of us to death, uh, gave us advice, um, and I tried to make it a point of coming to visit. I live in Florida now, trying to visit perhaps every six to eight weeks, and perhaps for somewhat selfish reasons. I just loved being around him, listening to him talk. I could listen to him forever, and either I would come up myself or my wife or my kids. And one thing that I remember, and this is similar to what so many of you already said, uh, when I had friends from Florida visiting with me here, visiting my father, they took to him so quickly. And whenever I see these friends again, they always remind me of how wonderful and warm a person my dad was and how they could just listen to his stories for hours on end. I want to thank uh, all of the kind words that have been said about my father. Um, and I want to let you know that some of the things that I heard today are some things that I had not heard before. And I'm so glad that I heard those. We are all going to miss him terribly. Uh, an incredible man, incredible father, father-in-law, and grandfather. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Charlie. Lovely. I will uh, now close, um, and I understand, I recognize that I'm all that separates you from either the restroom or the hors d'oeuvres. Now, now, in a predominantly military crowd, that would be very dangerous for me to form that kind of impediment. But if you'd give me just a very few minutes, I will let you go very shortly. Of the many accolades and tributes that Patricia and Val and Siobhan and Charlie and Larry and I received by email, by letter, I of course can only excerpt from a few of them and completely understand the grave danger I assume in excerpting. Um, first, not being able to excerpt from everybody and those from whom I do excerpt by errors of omission or context the meaning of the words or the passion of the sentiment are absolutely going to be understated. But let me try a few. From Mitchell Katz, Walter was such a good, smart, caring, and decent man. I liked his sense of humor and the pur purposeful manner he seemed to live. I still would have liked to have seen him in a pair of jeans, and Charlie has already alluded to that. Just once. But I'm sure he's going to make the hereafter a stylish erudite, erudite as well as a friendly space. I feel very fortunate to have gotten to know him during the past five years and to have been his friend. From Chuck Dolan, he speaks of my dad's impeccable memory, not just for diplomatic issues, but also for the finest things in life. 
And in a conversation Chuck and I had not too long ago, and this resonated with me, it's obviously resonated with Charlie and Larry because they've alluded to the same. It's we continue to catch ourselves. I would like to ask Dad this question. Or I'd like to ask Walter the question. Darn, I can't. From Alan Heil, who wished he could be here, he is returning tomorrow, I believe, from a long planned trip down under to Australia and New Zealand. Our admiration of the master, Walter Roberts, is unbounded. His friendship, generosity, expertise, and his commitment. From Ruth Godson, writing longhand a beautiful letter from Israel, and I will just excerpt one paragraph. Both of you, the you in this particular letter are Patricia and me, both of you are only too well aware of his many magnificent qualities. Huge acuity, patriotism, his record of public service to name but a few. But for me, the salient attribute was his huge generosity of spirit to all, especially when they were in difficulty. Joe, that was Ruth's husband, Joe and I were the beneficiaries of that too. He looked after so many people so freely and with such kindness and without any wish for reward. And from Bill Keel, how often has this phrase been used in sports, business, academia, and in other fields when referring to the link between mentors and those they mentored? In the field of public diplomacy, the members of the greatest generation were the giants on whose shoulders all have since stood. Walter Roberts, first among others of his generation, mentored the initial cadre of foreign service officers with the new U.S. Information Agency. That generation mentored my own generation of public diplomacy professionals. We, in turn, see our clear duty to the next generation of public diplomacy officers now in the State Department and other agencies. And so it goes on. Beyond the government reorganizations, the turf battles among and between government entities, the enmity between political parties, to the strengthening of a valuable tool of foreign policy in the pursuit of a peaceful and more prosperous planet. And finally, at least for me today, from Amy Hastings, former executive director of the Salzburg Global Seminar. Walter has come to represent to me and to many others the ideal of the public servant. In service to his country, but more importantly, to the highest and noblest purposes it should represent to the world. For me, as I've already said, his fierce loyalty to family and friends and his interest and engagement in everything of interest to them and everything that they might be in doing, might be doing, will long endure. I'm not sure, I think it was Jody who mentioned just a few minutes ago that on the morning of his passing, he was as lucid as ever. And about two or three hours before he passed away, I spoke to him on the phone. He was weak but absolutely lucid, asking and requiring intricate detail of my latest foibles with United Airlines the night before <laughs> returning from Norfolk, Virginia to San Antonio and suggesting that United needed to be punished for that particular infraction <laughs> and stating to me how he looked forward to our visit the following weekend. I'm reminded in part because of what has already been said by various quotes from John Bunyan. My sword I give to him that shall succeed me in my pilgrimage, and my courage and skill to him that can get it. We're looking out at you all right now. When the day that he must go hence was come, many accompanied him to the riverside into which he went, and we're here today. So he passed over, and all the trumpets sounded for him on the other side. Trumpets indeed. The first one sounded by my mom. And everybody around her and now around them are only beginning to get a hint of the intellect, the humor, the insight, 
the warmth and the depth of the true gentleman who had just joined them and, his tw and the twinkle in his eye. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us here today. Let's proceed to the reception.